do. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell, and this is the Dice Tower. Uh, today we're doing Dice Tower Q&As with designers, so I got three designers lined up, and we're gonna talk to them a little bit, and I will give you the opportunity to ask questions if you want, with the exception. You cannot say, I'm designing a game, and then proceed to tell everyone here about your game. If you do, we'll take the mic from you. This is not an advertisement for your games. Uh, we appreciate that you want to design, but the reason I have to say all these things is because <laughs> these have all happened in the past. Um, and the other thing is you cannot ask, do you start with the theme or the mechanisms? Because that's been asked about 7,000 times, so we gotta do something different. Um, also, one designer will walk out if you ask that question, so. <laughs> so. So anyhow, a big thank you from me to you. I'm really glad you're here. And we're just gonna jump into this. Um, and we're gonna start with the most famous designer in the world, Dr. Reiner Knizia. So, thank you. Now right here. Thank you, sir. You know, I'm currently designing a game but I'm not quite sure if I should start with the theme or the mechanism. <laughs> well, you're allowed to do this. <laughs> okay. Now, um, you are known, see, most designers when they come up, I'll say, they're known for this game or this game, and you have about 30 games that fit in that category. Do you, if you were meeting someone and you wanted to impress them, which game would you tell them was the game that you designed? You know, these people get more and more sneaky on asking me the same question over You're and right. over I'm not again. Asking, no, but see, that's not, I'm not asking you your favorite game. Which one is my favorite I'm child? Not, I'm asking you, which one do, would you impress people with the, the most? It depends on the person, because uh, okay, good point. if you take the worm game, Picomino, whatever you call it, I think, forgive me for saying that, I think it's a fantastic mechanism because all the other dice games so far are all kind of Yahtzee types, and suddenly this is 90% orthogonal to it. I'm a mathematician. Uh, but again, some people don't like uh, dice games, so they like uh, Euphrates and Tigers because it's nice, complex, and so on. It's, it's an impossible question to be asked. I think I should take the microphone away from you. <laughs> mm. Well, no, but I mean, I, but I, yeah. what I'm saying is, and this is uh, kudos from me because You've designed so many games that are well known. Many designers have their magnum opus, and then they have a secondary game, and then they have a bunch of games we don't talk about. Yeah. Um, but you have. Do you even know the number of designs that you that you have published? Say again. How many designs have you published? Is it over two hundred? Six hundred. Okay, so I was close. Close. Now six hundred. That's more than probably all the designers at this convention combined. That's probably the number I would mention to impress rather than an individual game because I have actually in my studio a separate archive where there is one copy of each edition. So each different language edition, so the Lord of the Rings is 20 editions in 20 different languages and this is over 2,000 boxes. Wow. And if that doesn't impress you then no individual <laughs> game though. You asked me, sorry. Well, you mentioned Lord of the Rings, and that's an interesting thing because nowadays cooperative games are the really hot. But you did one years before everyone else. Why do you think it took so long for other people to kind of jump on? I don't know. It's, uh, maybe it needed some more successes through electronics coming in because that makes it easier to build up an enemy and therefore make uh, the game group playing cooperatively. Uh, maybe there were one or two children's games actually initially who tried that and so maybe people thought that's just a children's game. I don't know. Sometimes it takes a big success, maybe without a license, because people might have said the success of Lord of the Rings was the Lord of the Rings and Tolkien and not the game. You never know. Well, what made you decide to do a cooperative game? Because it hadn't been done much up to that point. Well, this was not my choice. It was inevitable because I agreed to do the license for the Lord of the Rings. And then what do the players expect? They buy the game because they're enthusiastic about the book. 
the book takes a certain viewpoint of the story, you cannot turn this around. They expect to find the same story arc in the game. So therefore, quite naturally, you are a hobbit, hairs are growing on your feet, and you cannot take a knife and stare as a Sam and put it into Frodo's back to get the ring. It doesn't work. The, 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 the Fellowship of the Ring is cooperating together, so uh, it's inevitable, so get on with it and do it. Now, several of your games have recently been picked up by Fantasy Flight, and now um, the name of the company has changed. Asmodee. Right, but they have a new branch that does... Oh, yes, uh, uh, Wind, 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 Wind Rider games. Right, right. Um, and so they said they're reprinting classic Euro games, but as far as I can tell, so far they're printing your classic games because the first three are all yours. Um, what do you think about that as you, you bring these games back? I'm, I'm fascinated about it. Uh, I think there are lots of classic games, not only mine, which really deserve to be produced very well and presented to the world. Fantasy Flight can do that in an ideal fashion, and also they have the reach beyond America to really have lots of cooperation partners so that a lot of people can enjoy these games. They deserve it, and uh, I think these games are still relevant today as they were 20 years ago. Well, you mentioned that, and that's interesting to me because most games I play from 20 years ago are not relevant today. Uh, when I play Samurai and, and, and Tigers and Euphrates and, and Ra, um, I play them and they feel like they could have been designed this year. What is it that makes these games last so long, as opposed to games that I play and I'm like, put that back in the cupboard? I don't know. Maybe the secret is make 600 and some will stick. <laughs> I mean, you always, as a designer, try to do something which is relevant and which has depth and which has innovation in it, but that's no guarantee that it will live. Some, uh, some will live longer, you don't know. It's just the world is changing and our games are a mirror of, of our world, and so some will lose relevance quicker, and if you're not relevant, you're not successful. Well, what have you seen change in those 20 years from there now? Have you have you designed games differently? Are you looking at the... I mean, the board gaming world has obviously exploded. When you were designing games, there was less than a quarter of what we have now. So what has changed most for you? There are many more game designers. There are many more games, as you say. There are more publishers. There are an overwhelming number of new releases. The really big challenge is how do you stand out from the crowd? This is a challenge for the designer because the publisher needs it. A lot of my games today get turned down from publishers who say, this is a really nicely designed game. We had a lot of fun. It's very well balanced. It's almost perfect, but we are still missing the wow factor. We don't want it. So it is very difficult to stand out from the crowd. Uh, and this forces you to be innovative, to find something, maybe to take bigger risks. Uh, but I think it keeps us on our toes. You need to be relevant. Otherwise, you will be insignificant. Uh, this is much bigger a challenge today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Of course, we have many more opportunities. On the other hand, you see, Today, we are living in a world which changes extremely quickly. Uh, the electronics, uh, the information possibilities, uh, it, it, is, it is radical what's changing, our, our cultures. Yeah. When I started my business, there was no internet. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, when, when my father started his business, there was no television. I mean, it, it's just, it's, um, when, my, when my grandfather started his business, there were no cars. I mean, it's, it's just amazing what happens. And uh, this will change our games and will keep changing them. All right, well, we have time for a, a few questions. If anybody has any, just raise your hand and we, you can ask. We got one over here. The least fun job at a convention is the microphone holder. Because you got to run. Make sure the next question is from that corner. 
When you ask a question, make sure you're like almost kissing the mic. Okay. I don't have a, a game designed. Uh, just it's a safe question. What what do you do with the the designs of games that don't get picked up by publishers? Do you keep them? Do you in incorporate those ideas into the future games? Or, or do you hope that the market will change and there will be a future opportunity to release those? Was that the question for you or for me? No, it's definitely <laughs> for you. I, I throw mine in the garbage. Yeah. Um, if you invest a lot of time into design and it doesn't work, it's a disaster. Uh, I think you have to be your own hardest critic. That means if I have a game which I think is perfect and I want to offer to a publisher, I usually find a publisher. And it's not because the doors open maybe a bit easier. If I don't have a good product, they don't do it because they love me. Um, I might have the advantage that I get sometimes a better and fairer and opener feedback of what is wrong or what doesn't work. And that gives me the opportunity to go again and change it. I don't like it because once I'm finished with my design, I want it there and I don't want to rework it. But sometimes it's necessary and sometimes you get the insights when you are away for it because the publisher keeps it for half a year. A year. Uh, and look at it again, play it again, and say, okay, now I look at it from a different perspective because I have moved on and I do something with it. In the very rare instances, I have a graveyard upstairs uh, where I have to see, I can no longer offer this game because I can't stand behind it fully and I embarrass myself by saying this is a good game because and now I think it's not a perfect game, then it has to go. It, there is... We've talked about the sunk cost fallacy. What is gone is gone. Putting more time behind a bad project which is not flying does not work. It happens. That's what art is. Um, you have to live with it. If you can't, don't design. All right. Any other guy question right here? Well, thank you. Um, I was wondering if the amount of innovation we see in, um, in board games, like uh, mechanisms, will increase with increased amount of designers, or will it decrease? Or have, have we seen the sweet spot of what is possible in board games, or will there be more in the future? All right, so you're asking, uh, there's a lot of innovation in gaming, and now that there's more designings, do you think we'll see more innovation, or well, is that kind of plateauing? I do not believe in plateaus. Uh, I think people from the patents offices in history who said everything has been invented that can be invented uh, is not true. But I think also in which direction this will go is very unclear. If somebody of us knew, he would be extremely successful. So, I mean, who could have foreseen the mobile phones and what it does? Today we have more than a billion people walking around in this world with a game in their pocket. Who could have foreseen that, yes? And soon we'll have some implants in there, mandatory by birth, uh, and then you can play games all the time. You can sit at school and smile at the teacher and play your game in your head, or whatever. Who knows? So I don't believe in plateaus. I think we will have vast developments based on the vast developments in, the, in, the, in, in our world the best thing that can happen to a designer is that the world changes radically because the status quo is not very good as a platform for innovation, but if everything changes, that's what you want to have because that gives you lots of opportunities. Where they go, you never know. It is a lot of luck and randomness where the success goes and everybody runs after a successful game, uh, but it will go somewhere. I'm not sure where we are going, but we'll go somewhere. All right, we'll take one more question. Anyone? All the way over here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like, how much money do you make from um, doing all the board games over the year? I did not hear that. He wants to know how much money you make. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> 
the realities are the vast majority of the games sell a thousand copies, some of them sell less, some of them sell a little bit more. Uh, from an overall point of view, it's the same as in the movie industry. Most of them lose money, very few make money and subsidize the other work. So I have some nice games, some children's games, where I have a very, very high hourly rate. Uh, I, mean, I mean, would be a multi-millionaire if I could only do these. The question is, you never know which one it is. I know I'm not answering your question, and you didn't really <laughs> expect me to. Uh, it, the point is always the same. You have a few outliers which make you good money. If you win the game of the year, you make good money. It subsidizes your work for a few years when the dry years come, where you don't find the big publisher, and then uh, 500, 1,000 euros there, you need to pick up a lot of these to get through the year, yes? So I'm not starving, absolutely not, but it's, you need to see it in the perspective. You cannot just see the one success and say, look, if I make one of these and make another one of these, most of the games are not greatly successful from a financial point of view. I don't design games for finance. I, don't design, I design games because that's my calling. That's what I love to do from the morning to the evening. Money doesn't count as long as I have to eat and a roof over the head. And that's what the games pay for. All righty. Well, thanks so much for coming on the Dice Tower. We Thank you for it. having me. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. And I have not insulted you. You what? What now? I have not insulted you. You said you would only send me away if I insult you. So well, why do I have to go now? Yeah, you're always trying to stay longer. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right, well, now, one of the hottest games here, one of the designers for that, we're going to have Tony Boydell come on up and answer some of your questions. Oh. Sorry. Hello. Oh, my God, my voice. No, it's okay. Uh, right into uh, the mic is where, you, that way people hear you best. I think some people have been wishing for me to shut up and my voice is going now, so wish granted. Well, what do you think? Okay, so you have a very hot game here. I saw people screaming about it. What, what, um, well, there you go. What, what do you think about that? What's it like to have a game that people are running to get? Uh, it's, it's very cool. It's taken a long time. We've been doing uh, Surprise Day Games for 13 years, and we had our first queue for games yesterday, and that was very pleasing. Now, very I've heard exciting. you've been working on this game for a very long time. Yeah, almost 13 years on that as well. Yeah, 10 years to design the game. So why did this one take longer than other games? <clears throat> well, it was, um, it's got a quite a lot of interactions with lots of cards, and so it takes a lot of development to make sure that things aren't broken, things aren't overpowered. Um, so that takes a lot of playtesting, and I kept putting it on the shelf and coming up with other games in between. And then eventually, when I felt it was ready, we pushed it forward for publishing, so. So how do you know that moment when you think the game is ready? Because I've met some people who their game will never be ready. Well, I think when your playtesters ask to play the game and they're not interested in trying anything out, they just want to play it for fun, that's a, a pretty good clue. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what, tell us a little bit about the theme and the background of the game. Well, the I mean, we should probably tell people what game we're talking well, about. Well, yeah, the game is called Guilds of London. Um, the theme is based on the fact that in London, from the sort of the Middle Ages, a lot of the major industries were being controlled by little cartels, little groups of people who basically oversaw the success of those um, industries. So there was a guild of goldsmiths, a guild of merchants or the mercers, a guild of fishmongers and so on. So they basically cornered that market. And if you wanted to be successful in that market, you had to be a part of the guild. You had to be in with the club. Um, there's currently 108 of them, and I thought that was a great theme to start my game design with. Themes are great. Amen. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, that's where, I, that's where I came from. Started with the guilds and uh, took it from there. Now, you, you said you've been here for 13 years, or you've been coming to this convention for a yeah, while? I've been coming to this convention since it started 10 years ago. So what do you think about the growth and where the hobby here in the UK is growing? I think it's wonderful. I mean, I 
took a break today and wandered around with my family. And there was something for all of them. So my, you know, my young lad likes sorts of games that I do, so he was enjoying those. There was lots of Star Wars stuff for the boys, the elder boys. Like, you know, the, the live role-playing stuff, the cosplay, they loved it. It's brilliant. It's the, the variety. Now, the UK does not <clears throat> necessarily known in the board gaming world for a plethora of game designers. There, there are many, but there are many games I came here and saw that I didn't even know they existed. Um, do you think that we're going to start seeing more of the international interconnections happening here? What can, what can be done to, make, to get the names out more? Well, I think um, a lot of the uh, British designers are already working with each other, and they meet and they play test in the same groups. And we often meet at each other's houses, and we have weekends where we're play testing each other's games. So there's a lot of us that, that know each other really well. And if you look at the rule books of our games, you'll see that they're all crediting each other in, in those rule books. Um, so I think, you know, just by sheer force of will, we're, we're working together to get get the British game design stuff out there. Now, are you influenced by outside sources? Like, was the, when the German game invasion happened to some degree, was that a, a, yeah. a factor? Yeah, for me, I started off doing light card-based games, and it was when I started playing more complicated Euros, particularly games like Agricola or Princes of Florence or Age of Steam when Martin brought that out. It showed what could be done with a board game. It wasn't just something light and humorous. It could be deep and it could be stimulating and interesting and interactive. And that changed the direction that I certainly took. And the more games I played, the more that they supplement my ideas. So what do we have to look for in the future from you? Well, I'm going to try a little bit of collaboration. It seems to work for a number of the British designers. <laughs> Can they get Spiel des Jahres nominations and so on? So I want some of that action. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think I'd have try a few years of collaborating with some other players. That'd be good fun. All right. Well, do we have any questions uh, that don't include money? <laughs> I make no money out of board games. <laughs> Why did you start designing games? All right. Why did you get into designing games? Um, I think I started, my favorite game when I first started was um, Samurai Swords, which is a sort of a slightly more, inter you know, slightly more, um, slightly deeper version of Risk. Right. Yeah, it's Mike called Shogun Gray. by some. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I really liked it. And we played it so much that actually we saw little bits of the game. We thought, why is that route going from A to B when A to C would be better? And we started tweaking the rules and making more rules for the ninja piece in the game. And I really enjoyed it. And when we played it again with our own rules and they all worked and it made the game feel better for us, we wanted some more of that kind of action. And I really liked doing that. So started tweaking some of my favorite games with a few rules and then started playing Magic the Gathering and then didn't have any money for anything else. So all I could do is stay at home and <laughs> we'll, design We've all games. done yeah. it at some point. Exactly. Any other questions? Anyone? Oh. Is this a question about Skandaroon? <laughs> no. um, considering how rich the British history is, do you think that that's an area that Eurogames in particular can cover better? So the UK's history, um, considering your game is about the Guilds of London. So I, could, I couldn't hear that one. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I... Oh, sorry. I'll speak louder. Is that okay? Yeah? Can you hear? Yeah, yeah so cool. Sorry. Um, considering how rich British history is, do you think it's an area that is underdeveloped in board games in general, considering how many... I, sorry, Tom, I can't hear at all. <coughs> I'm, I think I'm going <laughs> deaf as well as horse, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> so you're saying uh, games are overdeveloped? No, no, considering British history... Considering how, developed British, how, how good British history is, just considering underdeveloped in games. Ah, no, no, yes, I do. Wait, are, we have a Thank you. I do. I mean, every, I got your question now. I think we've done railways to death. I love railways. They're wonderful and they're romantic, but there's an awful lot of rich history that we could, we could be delving into. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. You got any uh, examples in mind? Uh, you got me. You put me on the spot. <laughs> well, I well just, just give me... Give me Wi-Fi access in 10 minutes on Wikipedia. I'll okay. find something. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Over here in the front. Oh. Actually, yeah, while we're moving the mic, I have an example. 
Joseph Bazalgette and the Sewers of London. That's a great theme. Considering the um, population and prolification of technology, what is your stance on hybrid games, or do you feel like board gaming is a space for phoneless and technologylessness? Kind of what's your stance on that? It'd be interesting to know. Thoughts on combining electronics and board games? Um, I spend all day working with computers. I don't really want to play my board games with computers as well. Um, but it's inevitable, isn't it, I think? I think so. I think so. So you're, not, you're going to design outside it? Yeah, I'm just going to carry on with, with cardboard and wooden pieces. Yeah. All right. I think we had a question up here somewhere. In the very front row. Um, I was just curious to think, because um, the UK is probably better known for miniature games than we are board games at the moment, but as we're seeing the, the, uh, the trend in uh, board gaming, the lines are starting to blur. Do you see this trend continuing, or are they always going to be two separate things? So there's miniatures and board gaming. They're starting to blur. <clears throat> well, if you look at a game like Scythe, that's got lots of gorgeous miniatures in it, but it's also got the, the Eurogame elements. I think they've been blurring for a while. And if you look at the K word, Kickstarter, it's the miniatures, K -word now? Yeah, okay. yeah, miniatures <laughs> can be the difference between not funding at all and funding with stupid amounts of money. Uh, I think it's already happened. All right, yeah, I think, I think it is happening more often too. We're starting to see that crossover and I wouldn't be surprised if we talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, well, I want to appreciate Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. And how many copies of the game are left? Zero. Oh, it's sold out. Too bad. But it will be in stores eventually. All right. All right, we got one more designer for you now, and that is Mr. Eric Lang. All right, so this has been a good year for you. Hello. <laughs> I have an idea. I want to make a game where you're hobbits, and one of you has to stab the other one in the back to take the ring. I actually, I thought that that would sound like a fun game. <laughs> I, I, I was like, I was sitting there making notes. <laughs> oh, I want to talk a little bit about card games. So we got a Munchkin collectible card game coming up this year. That's right. And so you've developed several card games. You started in CCGs to some degree, didn't you? That's right. Game of Thrones was my first game. And now you're back in the CCGs. Yep. <laughs> they pulled me back in. So what do you think about that design space? Is it harder than designing a, like a solid board game? That's a... I mean, yeah, every game is hard. Like, I have never designed a game that wasn't hard. Uh, at least a, a, any good game that wasn't hard. Uh, but... I love the CCG space. It's, I mean, I've been playing Magic since 1993. It was my first, uh, it's in my DNA, like the, how does, uh, collectible card games are designed. Uh, I took a, a little bit of a sabbatical from card games after uh, Warhammer Conquest a few years ago. I was like, I felt like I kind of explored all of the space that I thought th that I was into. And then I had a conversation with um, Phil Reed from uh, Steve Jackson. He said like, so, do you like Munchkin? I'm like, well, I love the jokes, I love the IP, I love all that stuff. It's like, you want to make a collectible card game for it? And instantly I was like, yes, I do. And just because I, like, the idea of doing a, a tournament playable, technically sound card game that is also based on ridiculous, adorable humor, that, was, that sounded like a space that I, I hadn't been there before, and I really relished the, I relished the opportunity to go, to go visit there and see what would come out of it. Uh, I have a, a co-designer on that, Kevin Wilson, one of my oldest friends. I designed Arkham Horror and all the games ever made. Uh, we, uh, we made this game together, and uh, it's sort of a blend of our two styles, and I really, I, I'm really excited about it. Now, when you design these collectible games or living games, mm -hmm. uh, you've designed some, you usually design the initial concept and a lot of the stuff in the base set, but as time goes by, sometimes parts of that are turned to other developers who are working on these cards and things. Yeah, absolutely. 
how does that feel? Do you ever like get a set and you're like, I would never have done that, or they should have done this? Well, <laughs> uh, I'm talking about ancient history, not current stuff. Yeah, yeah, clearly. Um, so yeah, there many games. Of course, I can't. I mean, I've got. Uh, four live living card games on the market right now. I've got a digital trading card game. I'm working on Munchkins. We've got Dice Masters. There's a, lots of lot of games. Of course, I can't design every card for everything. Uh, it largely depends on the publisher. Uh, Fantasy Flight has a really good, um, a really good and really experienced network of developers that work with me right from the very beginning. So they're involved in the game right from the start. Uh, like, I don't design any Game of Thrones stuff anymore. I don't design any uh, Cthulhu stuff anymore. It's, uh, and even Conquest is now largely turned over to their team. Uh, I'm involved. I, we, I help them do the planning, and I review cards, and I always send over ideas. But, uh, and of course, yeah, sometimes I see stuff that, like, I, you know, maybe I wouldn't have done that, but it's not just my game. As soon as I release, especially a collectible game, as soon as that's released into the wild, it's not my game anymore. It belongs as much to Fantasy Flight and the fans of the game as myself. So even if it's something that I may not have done, if the fans like it, then it's clearly the right, cho the right choice for the game. Now, someone asked earlier about the crossover of miniatures and board games, and you definitely have a little bit in there. I'm a pretty games? big fan of toys, yeah. So do you feel like that's a toy box that's been recently opened because of Kickstarter and the, you know, the, the ability to make these great pieces? This is something you've to always a, wanted to do? To a degree. I mean, like, so I'm, I'm 13 years old at heart, and I love, I love toys. I love bright colors. I love the... Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I've always wanted to work on games with really cool miniatures, and I did. I mean, with, uh, even back with um, Chaos in the Old World, uh, the fact that we had all these really cool plastic toys was a big part of the enjoyment for me. Uh, I'm not sure if Kickstarter really... I mean, Kickstarter enabled a lot of... Uh, a lot of publishers to enter the field, but I'm not sure if it's necessarily responsible for the uh, for the quality of miniatures. I just think that collectively we're always looking. There are so many games on the market, like Reiner was saying earlier, that we're always looking for different ways to stand out. And I mean, a clear way to stand out is to keep raising the the bar of quality. Game design that bar is uh, it's a bit of a moving target, right? What's fun for some is not maybe not fun for other. You can't just you know. Add, add, add five qu pints of fun extra to the game to make it to raise the bar. But for visuals, it's very, very clear when a miniature is higher quality than, um, than otherwise. So it's a very clear path for upgrade. So a lot of our producers and manufacturers and sculptors, especially sculptors, have just gotten better at their craft. And you're gonna, miniatures are going to keep getting better over time. Uh, I'm working on a game right now, which I'm sorry I can't talk about, but I just saw uh, this morning, I saw some of the miniatures, like they showed some of the miniatures, and I was like dumbfounded by how awesome they are. Yes. Got to throw a tease in there. Yes, thanks for that, everyone here is. Okay, now, you're working with uh, IPs uh, a good chunk of time. The Star Wars. Uh, and licenses, yeah. Licensing, uh, intellectual properties. Does that, does, do you feel like that's, helpful that it kind of guides your design, or is it restrictive? How do you feel? Would you prefer, if you had your druthers, would you pick a, a, a licensed property or have the freedom to do what you want? Oh, I need to do both. Uh, I love designing licensed games, and I love designing original games. I would be really unhappy if I couldn't, if I had to give one of them up, because they, uh, they both fill very, very different uh, needs as a designer, and I think that very different needs as a, um, as a player. So. I want to like if I would love to as a player. I'd love to pick up a Star Wars game because I love Star Wars, and I'm looking for. I'm always looking for a new experience in the Star Wars universe. Uh, I would probably rather play that than you know Space Wars uh, with uh, Space Wars with generic guys. However, I'm also always looking for a really cool new IP, a really cool new some cool new hook that we haven't seen before, some twist on the familiar. Uh, I was did a seminar earlier today. I was a big, big fan of uh, FFG's Android universe. It's cyberpunk, but it's a really cool new take on it. I love that, and I love to design stuff like that. I mean, with Chaos Ball, I, uh, that was an IP of my own design. That uh, it's. I mean, I want to take cartoony, almost anime-style cartoony stuff and bring it into violent sports. I thought that was a that was a cool uh, that was a cool mashup. I could not, I mean, even if you put a gun to my head, I have to say I can't pick one. Okay, well, since you mentioned violence, what are your thoughts about Blood Rage 
making the nomination list for the Spiel des Jahres. Uh, well, we didn't get nominated. We got. I'm we sorry, were, the recommended list. We're recommended on the recommended list. list. I mean, I am. I'm definitely surprised. Uh, at no point, I can honestly say, at no point during any of the development of Blood Rage was I thinking, "Well, I've got a Spiel des Jahres on my hand." Right? I was like, <laughs> I always thought, like, I just I make the game, kind of games I like, and I like really immersive games. Um, they do often feature a little bit of a little spot of violence, but that's. But I mean, I think they're overall. Even though they do, I think they're overall. I wouldn't make a, make a game if I didn't feel it was overall positive. Uh, it didn't. It was an overall positive experience for the people that were playing it. Uh, the fact that it, the, the Spiel des committee even looked at the game was surprising to me. I thought they would just look, take one look at the cover and say, nope, we're not even going to play that. Uh, yeah. The fact that it was on the recommended list is really hopeful to me that the, the breadth of games that, the, that they'll look at to consider for the future is going to be, become much, much wider. Yeah. I like how you say your games have a little violence. A little um, bit. All right, anyone here have any questions for Mr. Lang? Oh, in the back there. Hi, hi Tom. Hi, Eric. Um, Hello. I just picked up Blood Rage. I'm really excited to play it when I get home. Um, I hope you like it. <laughs> and my question is somewhat related to that game that I know is originally on Kickstarter. And when it came through Kickstarter, there's always you know, tons of stretch goals, uh, cool mini or not, and uh, guillotine to a ton of add-ons. Um, as a person who backs a lot of Kickstarter games, I've begun to feel Kickstarter fatigue, where it's like, if you don't jump in, if you don't get all the bits and pieces, you feel like you're kind of missing out. And sometimes even want to avoid the Kickstarters all up because of so much stuff added to them. When you're designing such a game that kind of has that growth on Kickstarter, do you feel that it's um, fatiguing for you as a designer? Is it sort of like, oh god, I got to do 10 more stretch goals, 10 more stretch goals, I can't keep designing this game, or do you actually enjoy that? Well, I put 11 stretch goals in, not 10. Uh, no, so um, I, uh, I've, been, uh, I've been designing games for Cool Mini or Not right, since almost the beginning of the Kickstarter, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, revolution phase, whatever. Um, at first, I was actually really fascinated. I, uh, as a designer, I thought it was really cool to design a game that was kind of open-ended in how much of the how much of the game would actually be released. So uh, I thought it was a really cool design challenge, right? I'm going to make a game, and I don't know exactly how much of the full game experience we're actually going to launch because we don't know how much of it it's going to fund. Um, nowadays, I mean, of course, with the bigger publishers, it's a little bit. It's kind of a moot point. You know the game is going to fund. It's just a question of how much. So I treat, um, the way I treat board games now, uh, and this started with Blood Rage, actually. Uh, I designed Blood Rage as, as a two to five player game. The only reason that we, we had to cut off uh, the fifth player was because we wanted to make sure that it fit a certain box size and a certain uh, retail price. Uh, but it was I knew right from the beginning it was balanced for two to five. It was, I wanted to make sure that uh, as long, if we put it on the box, it's a good experience for that player count. Uh, and what I did then is I designed, I designed the game to be a streamlined and a streamlined expression of Viking pillaging as I could possibly make. But I wanted to. Then I uh, designed a, a number of little modular expansions that add complexity in a very specific way. So none of them absolutely 100% necessary. But for people who want a more complex game. Like, say, if they wanted more complex board interactions, they would get the gods expansions. If they wanted slightly more complex uh, different types of units, uh, different types of um, warriors and units, you would get the mystics expansion. That's pretty much my, uh, my approach now for, um, for Kickstarter. Uh, the others, which is the game that I, the, the big box game, it's really huge. That's what you're, one of the things you're talking about, has millions and millions of expansions. Uh, I designed, I designed that knowing that it was going to be a big Kickstarter because the art is amazing. I knew it was going to be a big thing. So I designed it to be 100% modular. So all of, it's a big box set that you can play everything you want out of the core set, but everything else is just variety. It's closer to games like Cosmic Encounter, which is one of my favorites. I hear Tom kind of likes it a little bit. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, but I just wanted to make stuff like, you know what? You don't need it, but it's just more cool stuff, more cool teams, more cool monsters. They plug into the base game exactly, and it's just different kinds of uh, fun in exactly the same system. You don't have to buy any of it, but if you're like me and you just love lots of variety, then just cherry pick the ones that you want. That's my philosophy as a designer going on through, and you'll probably see that as a, um, 
from a lot of publishers in the future too. I think there's going to be less emphasis on exclusives and stuff that, uh, I mean, they have to have it to a degree because monetization, blah, blah, blah. But I think you'll find that there, we're a lot more focused on, as an industry, we're a lot more focused on the long tail, the, the, what happens after Kickstarter and basically essentially making Kickstarter as a, a marketing event. It's, here's this really cool game. We're going to show how many people are interested in it. Um, and hopefully that'll translate into uh, more retail sales later. And so Blood Rage has proven that out so far. So fingers crossed for the future. All right. Any other questions? Up here in the front. When you're designing games, do you design them for you and your friends to enjoy playing or to become successful? I didn't catch all of that. Do you design a game for you and your friends or do you design it to be successful? Ah, I, I love that question. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to some level, I mean, games are as much art as science. I actually believe they're much more art than they are science. Um, the, so, if you believe that, then games are um, the the that games are mostly art. There's a level of expression to it, so it matters. It matters a lot more that um, that you know a game is coming out from myself or from Reiner Knizia than the actual game, the, the theme itself. The way I would approach a theme is very different from the way Reiner would approach one. Very different from the way Tom would approach one. So, at the end of the day. I feel like any game I make, I need to enjoy. It has to be something that I would want to play and I would love to play. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be only for me. Uh, a big part of what I, uh, why I like in designing games is that I'm always looking for cool new game experiences and I want to broaden my tastes and broaden my horizons. So I will sometimes pick something in a genre that I'm uh, in a genre or a platform that I'm not necessarily that familiar with or not that into. And I'll go play around in that for a little while. Uh, I used to play Warhammer, for example. I mean, I, we're in the fatherland of Warhammer here. I played Warhammer 40K as a kid. Uh, and I, I kind of got away from it for a little while. And I want to go back into it and see what, see what I was missing. And I found a new kind of enjoyment out of it that actually has informed a bit of my design uh, nowadays. Uh, not obviously, probably more subtly. But it has to be, I have to enjoy it. My friends, I don't care about them. But I have to enjoy the game, and ideally, uh, because I spend a lot of time playing games and still being a fan of games, I'm hoping that that will translate. All right, we got time for one more question? Exactly one more question. I make $5,229.62. Only that amount, thank you. Um, do you think... Blood Rage would have been such a success if it hadn't have been on Kickstarter? And if not, why not? I think we actually know the answer to that, don't we? Pardon me? Don't we know the answer to that? Because it came out. <laughs> well, so, I mean, I, I, so it is a good question. It is a theoretical question, so I can only answer theoretically, right? Uh, would Blood Rage have been a success if it wasn't uh, at retail, if it wasn't a big, kicks, uh, big Kickstarter? So it is very successful at retail. Um, thank you. Thank you guys for playing. Those of you who play it, I... Thank you a lot. Um, I think that it is a little bit of a chicken in the egg, right? I, I mean, when Cool Mini or not, they have a place, um, they have a position in the marketplace now that when, thank you, uh, like, can you guys hear me over that? <laughs> when they make a game, uh, when Cool Mini makes a game, now it's, go, uh, it's going to get a lot of attention. But remember, when we made Blood Rage two years ago, uh, Cool Mini was still, like, up and coming. Uh, so. We felt like we needed to make a Kickstarter to get the game out there for fans. I don't know, I honestly don't know if Blood Ridge would be as visible as it was if it wasn't had a big Kickstarter. It, would, might have, it may have been just another big box cool mini game. And I'm hoping that a big chunk of why, um, I'm hoping that Blood Rage is successful that, because it resonated. Um, and that, without a big, without like some big push initially, that hype might take... That guy plays Blood Rage. <laughs> uh, so that hype, like, there has to be... So the, hype, the hype train, as we call it in board gaming, it needs, so, it needs a catalyst. It is entirely possible that it could have gotten lost in a sea of other really cool games if it didn't have that big push. 
So I, I honestly don't know. Like, I still think, even for, I'm doing another big game, of course, for Cool Mini or Not, spoiler alert, that will be on Kickstarter at some point, either this year or next year. I do believe that the game should be on Kickstarter first to get that push, uh, just to make sure that everybody, like, so we can see exactly what the demand is going to be for this game. Is it going to be as big as Blood Rage? Is it going to be not as big? We don't know. That it will help us. Uh, I am, however, I am doing a bunch of games for Cool Mini Rot that are not going through Kickstarter at all. They're going direct to retail uh, because they're licensed um, or because they're... Um, or they're because they're not necessarily optimized for Kickstarter. Like I'm doing a Bloodborne card game that's coming out at Gen Con next year that's going straight to retail. It's a small card game, maybe not, it's not stretch goal oriented. I want to make one box. Um, I'm doing a Godfather board game, no expansions, just one box uh, that's coming out next year. They were totally not, they wouldn't have worked on Kickstarter. They were made specifically only for retail. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you have some new games coming out at Gen Con. Thank you. On further. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. Oh, that's, that means get out. Well, that's a very nice way of saying it. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a little odd for me because this is the only show I've done where now for a moment I have no co-host. Um, usually it's Eric or Z or, or Sam. Um, that's okay. I'm feeling... I'm feeling like I'm uh, ahead in that game, currently. Now, are, is our time up here? We have a few minutes. So if anyone has any quick questions, I can answer uh, maybe a few, although I'm, I, I've designed half a game. So <laughs> I don't know that I would be the best. My, most of my perspective on design comes with what I like and what I'm seeing. It's certainly changing. And I think today we saw a gamut um, from you know one of the original game designers up to a, well, Eric's not new, but a modern designer, I guess more so. Yeah, a, a classy designer. No, that's, that's a lie, um, but something. You're off the mic now. <laughs> um, does anyone have any final questions or anything before we shut down and go home? Uh, um, if you can hear me this time, how do you feel about UK Games Expo? How do, how you, do you feel about this expo? Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's uh, up, up and coming. I, th I think it's doing really well. Uh, it's, I, this is kind of like that perfect storm in a sense. Um, I feel this way about Origins too, where I can come and I can see all kinds of publishers and, and uh, you know, a bus and dice and, you know, people dress up like orcs and I can play games with people, but it doesn't feel too overwhelming. And if you don't know what that's like, you can go to Essen. Uh, and if you don't know what that's like, just cross a street in London during rush hour. It's very similar um, to that sort of thing. And so I, I like where it's at. Now, I hope it grows because that's good. But this is such a perfect, for me, I, I like that mix of it feels big, but it also feels small too in many ways. And that's nice because I can talk to lots of people here at Essen. You're like, hey. And there's many designers and publishers that I, I know, and I see them at Essen or Gen Con, and I sometimes say, hey, it's good to see you. We'll, we'll talk later. That's a lie. We are not talking later. Um, that we, we, when we say later, we mean at the next convention that doesn't have a lot of people at it. Anyone else? All right. Well, that doesn't bode well for our Q&A tomorrow. But <laughs> Sam will be back, so... Uh, we're going to do a Q&A tomorrow at 1 o'clock. It's in the same spot here. So that's your last chance. Think of good questions. Try to stump Sam. Um, you can ask, throw me some softballs. Um, guys, we really appreciate it. We've been having a great time here. We were surprised that there was more than 10 people here. I'd like to thank Eric and Tony and Reiner for coming in. They did a great job, and hopefully we've all learned something today. So thank you to all of them. All righty. Well, thanks so much. You've been watching and or listening to The Dice Tower. I'm Tom Vassell. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching The Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.